just want to say it's good to see you all, see new faces, old faces, and and uh, friends and family. You guys all are like a piece of my family and friends, and I look forward to every time I come. Pre-warning, every time I get away, it just means I have double passion when I come back, so I'm going to try to rein it in. <laughs> as I sit and reflect, you just realize how the, as John said in First John, I share because it makes my, and that word my can be my or our joy complete. That joy is found through the Word of God, and it's through Him. And I just love it. I love it, and it's so encouraging to meditate on the Word of God. Before your eyes get directed to this screen, um, what the Lord put on my heart this morning through here, before we go into leading up into where we're at in Matthew, if this is your first time here, second week, um, I love to preach, or if you're listening online, welcome. I love to preach through the Word of God through books so that I don't skip over anything and we wrestle through the hard stuff. I'll be the first one as a disclaimer to say I have not arrived. Um, I've learned that I have to preach myself and teach myself into maturity. So there's this thing that we can all have a fear of stepping into greater depths with God because then we're held accountable to it and we may feel like a hypocrite if we don't. If we don't um, live up to it. But my definition of a hypocrite is someone who does not try. We say this often as a hypocrite, you need to practice what you preach. Well, I get that spoken to me a lot as a pastor. You need to practice what you preach when people see that I stumble and fall. And my response to them is, I am practicing. And the last time I knew when I practiced basketball, I threw up some air balls. But the more air balls I shot, I eventually hit the rim and I eventually made it. So to me, a true hypocrite is someone who doesn't even try because they're afraid. It's, it's authenticity is the ability to say, hey, I'm not there yet. I've left. And we're pursuing perfect love, and we're on this journey, and there's grace and mercy as we stumble and fall. But as we become assured of who we are in Christ and that God is love, it secures our heart and our soul and gives us more and more confidence. And as we behold that, we truly become more like that. And my heart and my prayer for this church is that we go on to maturity. Today's message is actually a very mature. We're entering now into Matthew. Matthew 19 is, and I'm going to take it to the macro because that's where we're going after 1920. What I want you to learn through the scriptures, whenever you look at the life of Christ and when he spoke as a teacher, a rabbi, a pro, even a philosopher, he would take things mostly to the macro, mostly to the eternal things. He was always trying to get people out of the micro and bring them back into the macro using some type of illustration, parable, metaphor, redirecting it. Contrary to that, the traditions of men, the philosophers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders always wanted to hone in on the micro. But what God knew was a spiritual principle that behavior follows belief. See, legalism is all about behavior, and that's what's prevailed in the church in the past hundred years. It's behavior modification. It's all trying to focus on our behaviors in an effort to attain something. But what Jesus taught is until you understand truth, your behaviors aren't going to follow. And that's what I'm going to show you through the scriptures here is he just got to the heart of the matter. It's about what you believe and whatever you believe, you will behave. And so it was, it was big, it's macro, it's deep. And the reality is, he just talked, this is the word sanctification, is a growth process. It's where we're growing and understanding and partnering with God through the Word of God, the Holy Spirit. And we grow based on what we're currently believing. And so your and I's level to grow deeper, to grow more mature, it hinges on what we truly understand. And so taking that to heart, Proverbs is one of the wisdom books, and it says in Proverbs 4, this was even as a kid. Most of us had heard this, and it was a refrigerator verse, but it's so powerful if you do take it to heart. If you believe this is the very Word of God, not just Andy saying this, but this is when it says, my child or my son, my daughter, this is to you from God Almighty, from Jesus Christ. And he says, pay attention to what I say. So whenever you see that in scriptures, I encourage you to open your heart and your mind to consider something that maybe you have never considered before. Because what you're going to learn is when God does this in the Word of God, He's contradicting the Word of men, traditions of men. He's trying to get us to see the bigger picture because He knows if we're focused on the micro, that's all Satan can do because he's so small, is to continue to get us focused on the micro so we slowly perish and do not prevail. But here He says, my child, pay attention to what I say, turn your ears to my words. 
Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. And health to one's whole body. So this was a season I, I went through a tribulation period. The Lord asked me to be as authentic and just human because I am as a preacher, teacher. I struggle with the very same things you all do as well. Um, I'm not going to go into the full testimony, but I went through about 15 years ago a tribulation period where I was thinking I was going to lose everything. And my health struggled. And it was the hardest time in a natural season of my life. It felt like hell on earth. And I didn't, I was like, when we've all been to this, because we all struggle with temptations at times, we go through these trials, because it says we'll go through trials, where we're, where we're at our, our wit's end. And we say, God, what else? What did I do wrong? And all these questions begin to prevail. And because of that, it's our physical body is just the caboose. It follows the soul, and the soul follows the spirit. See, the spirit serves God. The soul serves the spirit, and the body just serves the soul. And so and that's what Jesus would taught. Now, that's not what the tradition of men teaches. And, and you'll see in scriptures, Jesus was always trying to teach that and correct that. And he's doing it again here in his word. He's saying, no, my word is what will produce health in one's whole body. And so I had asked myself, because I was a health coach at that time, do I really believe that the Word of God is living and active? That is a source of strength, a source of food that can regenerate my own body because that's not what I got taught in my natural teaching and philosophy as a whole. So that was one thing. But then it goes on to say, above all else, above all else. So that's supreme. That's sovereign. That's, that's major. Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So I had to deal with the reality of, wow, things aren't flowing really good right now. So the issue stems from my heart. And the truth is, I didn't guard my heart. Now, I didn't do it out of arrogance I wasn't I was doing it because I was ignorant and deceived as to how Satan tries to outwit us and my heart is always to try to help us as a church and so that season of tribulation was the worst of times but it also became the best of times because I learned I, I pursued I was at my wits end I was humiliated and because I was humiliated pride was no longer quenching the spirit and I began to say okay God before I take my own life I surrender to you and I'm just going to try to live out this word because I read it and it's so different from everything I've been taught and I, I can I really believe it because if I really believe it that's so different from everything else but before I take my own life I'm going to try this out and I did try it out and I, I saw the reality that the word is what it says see it's taught and caught and it never returns void. And so even if you don't believe me, my encouragement to you is begin to try it and just watch what will manifest in your heart, what will manifest in your soul, and then what will also manifest within the physical body. The Word of God is living and active. It is the sword of the Spirit. It divides bone and marrow. It divides spirit and soul. And it will get to the very heart of the matter and bring life because that's what Jesus did. He came to give life and give it to the full where Satan comes to hate, kill, and destroy. And so I, I begin to embrace this bigger picture that, wow, my life was in a level of destruction. And it's because I did not guard my heart. I had chased other things that took hold of my heart. And that's what today's about. The bigger picture is what are those things that, are, that we've given our heart to? And that's why was, we're no longer finding the source of security, peace, pleasure, and joy that we once did. The simple thing that the gospel is just saying over and over and over again is you're going to see Matthew ties into the book of Hosea. And if you've ever studied the prophet Hosea what, and what he spoke as a metaphor, he, he married this adulterous, promiscuous woman named Gomer. And, and it was all about, Gomer, why do you keep chasing all these other loves of your life and not just him, which was really Christ? 
See, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the fullness of everything. I am love. And, and when you place your whole heart in me, that is the one constant. See, we can't change or control anything else besides us. And when we find our safety and our security and our very essence of intimacy in love with God, then we're safe, we're strong, and secure. The minute we begin to give that unto other things, then our guard goes down. And that's the thing that Jesus keeps coming to protect now that you just have to know how Satan works. Satan's going to use anything in the natural realm because it's not an absolute. So that could be, I, I'll just use myself as an example. I began to use my own strengths, giving my heart to pride and what my hands could do. I started a business and it became my baby and it was doing really well at the time. But even at the height, I remember before even the fall, I was sitting there saying, God, why is everything going so well? But I've lost that sensitivity to your Holy Spirit. And my peace and my joy are waning, even though I've attained more. So before the fall, my soul had already, naturally, my soul had already begun to fall. And so I gave my heart to what my hands could do, my work, my strength, my energy. I gave my heart unto this job as a, my baby, and it, and it began to take control of even my lone life with my marriage. And then it began to take time away from my own new baby, my daughter Grace at the time. And I had to begin to answer all these questions of God. How did it get so out of control? And he gently came to with grace and mercy and said, Andy, you know, through the word of God, this is just the pattern of the world. This is the deception that leads to a slow perishing process that at that time I was ignorant to and I never understood how it all worked. But today I hope to help you see how it works, but even to see the bigger picture, because as you go deeper, you become stronger in who you are. So learning how to guard your heart. And so to guard your heart, you have have to answer what do I love most and what motivates me what excites me what desires do I have because everything rises and falls from your heart and what you desire that word sire sire means Lord so whatever you desire is going to be Lord over your life. And that's why Jesus is saying, I'm not coming to condemn you. I'm coming to give you life and me as sire, as Lord, as love. See, God is love, 1 John 4, 8 and 16. Love is not just an emotion. Love is not just a verb, but absolutely and ultimately love is a person. See, the world doesn't teach us that. The world teaches us mostly love is an emotion and it's the honeymoon. And see, I'm going to go to the wedding because that's where we're at in Matthew 19. I'm not going to go to next week. We're going to get into the minutia of marriage and it's actually a section on divorce. See, the Pharisees and Sadducees try to throw one more curveball at Jesus before he goes to his big picture that I'm coming back from my pride, the wedding supper of the Lamb, my second return. Matthew 20 through 20, the end, is about that. It's about the wedding supper of the Lamb, which we're going to go to today, as Andrew did such a great job saying it's all about, life is all about family. See, God created family so that we could understand true love through the lens of being a child, through the lens of being a husband, a wife, through the lens of different levels of intimacy so that we could truly answer what our heart desires. The fullness of the longings is truly all about love. But as the old song says, is we're looking for love in all the wrong places. We're Gomer. Not Gomer Pyle. Sometimes I feel like that. Just ignorant, not knowing how it works. But as it goes on to say here, as Proverbs 23 later on says, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you stand on the word of God, then you say, whatever I'm thinking in the attitudes, my imagination, whatever I'm seeing, I'm going to begin to believe, and whatever I believe is how I'm going to behave. See, that's the principle that Jesus knew, is behavior follows belief. So if you're not believing correctly, your behavior is really not going to follow very well. It may if you're bound by the law for a short period of time because of punishment, but what the scriptures actually teach you is if you live that way, it's gonna, it'll work to bind you up temporarily, but it's going to work against you in the long term because your soul will become deprived. It's grace that sets us free. It's intimacy. It's love. It's the greatest expressions of true love. So, and then it's all about this. See, we're going to go deep and we're going to go macro because if you don't answer the biggest questions you and I as human beings have is why do I have this perfect longing in my heart? See, there is a longing for perfection that every one of us has and that's why we call it our greatest strength and our greatest weakness because God is love. He's perfect love. And if the Holy Spirit is near you and around you, He's trying to lead you unto perfection. 
But the thing about perfection is you have to just get an understanding of what that true longing is about, the absolutes of it, the absolutes of true love and perfect love. And Andrew did a great job, which we're going to see here coming up next last week. But you have to understand, on the macro, what is your eternal destiny? Because if you're not believing right about your eternal destiny, that will limit how you live out here. If your belief, as so many of us have been taught by the traditions of men, that my eternal destiny is, this is all temporary on the earth, all the natural realm is temporary, I'm only here for 1,700 years, you're going to bear very little fruit. Because that's not what Jesus taught. Jesus said, no, you live here for 70, 100, 120 years, but then there is this transition where if I haven't returned, you're going to go there to the second heaven. You're going to be with me in the second and third heaven. But then know your eternal destiny is going back to the garden. Everything that's on the Father's heart and on Jesus' heart is not to escape this world, but to bring heaven back to it. See, if you don't know the eternal destiny of God's heart, God's will, God's desire, your desires will trump His desires. And the Father's desire is to be with His kids. And the husband, Jesus' desire is, you're going to see in Scriptures, it is jealous and longing for His bride, which is you and I. See, I began to get a revelation of that as I got married, and I'm very grateful for marriage, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. You'll see it even in scriptures. A little of my story, and some of my college friends are here, so they may laugh at this, not knowing. It's ironic how you came on the day we're here in Matthew, because they were friends and part of the wedding, and they know this story. Um, I had fallen in love with the Lord through a mission trip, um, and I had this deal with God. I said, okay, God, I will, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say this. I gave the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm going to remain a virgin um, because I love you and what you did for me. And, but I had this deal with God. I said, by the end of college, I just want to be married. <laughs> Well, that didn't so much work, and I hadn't found the right girl until then, until this girl named Kate Anderson showed up. Is she over there? I can't see this. Thing. So, uh, Ebnet at the time. And if you know our story, it wasn't love at first sight. In fact, she thought I was weird, and I thought she was stuck up. But she was coming off a heartbreak before that, and maybe I'm the rebound guy. I can secure enough to say that. <laughs> I married up in every way. I did, truly. No, for 20 years. Yeah. And I'm saying this because I've been meditating and reflecting all this because next Tuesday is our 20th anniversary. I didn't think we were going to make it through years five through seven. That's our mini tribulation. We all struggle in marriage. Marriage is very difficult. In fact, it's the most difficult relationship, humanly speaking, because it's the most intimate relationship. And that's why the end, it's all about a bride and a bridegroom. It's about mature love. See, we've got to grow from being a child and thinking like a child to growing in adulthood to learn how to think as married people because perfect love is about self-sacrifice, not self-seeking. See, we're, we all start out fallen and broken because of the fall, and this goes unto this. I'm going to get there, but I want to first finish this and then go into our story. So be here follow believe. So your eternal destiny, you need to know your eternity is natural as well as spiritual. It's just heaven's coming back to earth, and he's going to redeem the garden of earth again. You live here. Look around. This is your eternal destiny. Now it's going to be rebuilt, but you're going to still have humanity as part of your eternal destiny. If you don't know that, you're going to chase everything like Gomer did. The other thing is a term called eschatology. Is It's the transition time. There will be a seven-year transition on the earth when the bridegroom, Jesus, comes back. And if you don't think you're going to see it, you're going to live like you don't think you're going to see it. But if you believe the Word of God, Revelation 1-7, it says, Every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. What that means in Laylim's terms is you and I, everyone listening to this, will see that day. Whether you're seeing it from heaven looking down and coming with Jesus, or you're here on the earth, or you're in Hades, and I pray that nobody here is seeing it looking up. You will see this day, and that's why the Bible, and that's why you're going to see, starting in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus, his, what he's saying over and over in the Gospels is, watch, pray, and prepare. Watch, pray, prepare. Watch, pray, prepare. Because he's saying, children, you're spiritual beings, and you will see this day. Everybody is going to see this day. You, now, do you need to believe this to be saved? Not spiritually speaking. All you need to believe is that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. But you need to believe this if you want to be saved naturally on that day. 
because there will be a lot of people that perish because they don't know how to walk in their new identity through the power of the Holy Spirit and to lean on the supernatural when the natural is falling apart. That's the story of Acts. See, the story of Acts is when all the natural realm that we've leaned on so much in our life, and my heart is, is burdened because I believe we're in a birth pain. We just had it, and we might have another one coming up. I think the fall is going to tell a lot. But there is a day that the Bible said that our natural strengths aren't going to last. There's going to be plagues that will destroy the majority of, of the earth. And so we have to wrestle with these big pictures. Is it okay if I'm here? Am I going to bow to fear in that? When man can no longer control this thing, what am I going to do with that? Or am I going to walk like the early church, the patriarchs of our faith, that believing that he that in me is greater than he than anything out here? And that they could walk into these leper colonies, they could walk into these other things, and they would just begin to heal people, and instead of being afraid of it, they'd go to it. So I had to wrestle with that, and you have to wrestle with that as, hey, what if I'm here? But then you may have that thought like I do is, I might not be here. But we're not immune in the gospel from suffering. We are immune from sickness. That's not part of our suffering. That's Psalm 103. But the suffering you're not immune from is this. If your eternal destiny is that you live on a cloud and you're not seeing anything going on, that's not what the gospel teaches either. See, Jesus sees everything that's going on. He's the way, the truth, and life. And that's what love is. It starts out love is long-suffering. See, the suffering we'll face is one day, even if I'm looking down and seeing this tribulation period take part, the legacy or gift I want to leave to my family, if I'm not here on the earth, whether it's my daughter, my grandkids, or my great-grandkids, I want to see them prevail and not just get by. I want to see them to overcome and not have it overcome them. See, that's what motivates me to wake up each day. It doesn't matter to me whether I see it or not, is I want to leave a legacy of faith in that family line, that whatever family line. Now, in my opinion, if you watch me preach and teach, I do think I'm, we might be on, the, on the, the verge of seeing some of these birth pains happen more and more, and we might be here on this earth. I hear a lot of people talking about it. We can watch, pray, and prepare. So your eschatology matters. Whether you want to agree with it or not, you don't have to agree with it. You can choose to live however you want. It's just going to be the, the level of intimacy you have with God, the level of power and authority that you walk in supernaturally versus naturally is what you're really deciding. It's your choice. See, love's not force. I can't control it. God can't control it. Love is always voluntary. So you get to choose. That's the beauty of love. And that's what philosophy is. Jesus taught a different philosophy. He contradicted the philosophies of man, which if I get to it today based on time or next week, he just went against some of the great philosophers. Um, one that I'm going to... He called it tradition of men because it's not just one, but there, I think one had a very significant influence was Aristotle. If you really know history and you study Aristotle's works, Jesus really came down 300 years after Aristotle and just really contradict a lot of what Aristotle said. And Aristotle was taught by Plato, if you didn't know that. And so, not that everything that Plato and Aristotle taught was bad. No, remember, good and evil are intertwined. But most people don't even know that Aristotle ran for his life in his last days because he's legally charged with impiety, which is a lack of reverence for God. And so on his run, he became so sick with a, some type of a gut issue that he died naturally. But he was running because he was separating everything from religion. And Jesus came out of the scenes as a philosopher and tried to say, no, 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 there's something way bigger than this. I know you think you're smart by your, your earthly wisdom and what you're thinking here, but I, I'm the creator and I'm, I'm telling you how this works. And so, and then it really comes down to identity. Jesus taught a whole different identity. You can see yourself just as purely human. See, have you ever heard the term 100, give yourself 110%? That's what I lived on as a kid, especially in football. Well, it's the old saying. Uh, pain's temporary, pride's forever. Man, that's straight from hell. <laughs> Destroyed me. I live very proud because that's the, that is the chief principle of the world. That's what led to the fall. And see, so I was given about 100% naturally as a young man trying to do this thing on my own through my own earthly strength, my own earthly wisdom, the, the ways of this world. And then don't we give kind of, I'm going to give 10% to the church, 10% to faith, five-minute Bible study, devotion, 
Five to ten percent I'll give my, right, right? See, all Jesus said, no, 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 everything's inside out, upside down, let's reverse that thing. See, you give a hundred percent to me, and then you're only going to need ten percent in the natural realm to prevail. And that's really how it does work. It's very simple. It's just opposite. See, everything in the spiritual realm is opposites. Everything in the natural realm, there's two sides to truth. It's called the unity of opposites which I, I'll teach more and more on. In fact, I'm going to go, I know today's big, I know it's deep, I know it's heavy, but here's what I know. It's okay to be provoked. Somebody once did it for me. They challenged me to begin to think deeper, and all you have to do is start with curiosity. You seek with your heart, you will find. It's a promise in the Word of God. You just got to begin to get some level of curiosity, and I'm hoping to provoke your heart to say, whoa, what this guy's saying, there's something about this. I need to begin to investigate more into it. Because at the end of the day, he's the Alpha Omega, and it's all about this, church love. He's the Alpha and Omega, and He's the absolute source of it. And that's how you guard your heart. You give it to anything else, you're going to be hurt. See, you have to learn, that's why it says you cleave from your mother and father. We're going to go here next. But you also have to learn to cleave from your brother and sister. You've got to cleave from um, anything of this world. Cling or bind yourself unto Him, but then you can learn to love in a new way where it's giving versus receiving. That's the practical part we're going to talk about marriage next, next week is how, how it really does work. And do Kate and I have it all figured out? No, we don't. We're on a journey with you. 20 years in, is it our love perfect? No. No. Do we struggle? Yes. Does, can my daughter validate that? Do we get into conflict and fights? Yes. Why? Because here's what the Lord told me. Every time I get my mind on the micro, away from the macros, every time my relationship begins to struggle. See, when I forget the big picture and I get locked into these little things, that's what Satan wants us to do. And we fight over little things. And, and, and you get these new assignments and callings and desires on your heart that you begin to pursue. And then you've got to learn how to love one another in the midst of it. Even my life, wife and I are in this new assignment in ministry. And we're learning how do we really love each other in this new season of our life. Because if we don't learn how to do this, it's going to consume us. And we're going to be that statistic where, okay, it took our marriage as well. So you've got to fight for this. And that's what we're going to go to is this, this learning to fight for your marriage, learning to fight for relationships, learning to fight for yourself because we are in a battle. Satan's not going to stop. He's out to hate, kill, and destroy. And you can choose to put your head in the sand or you learn how to fight, but it's not the weapons of this world, it says, but it's with words. It's with taking captive our thoughts and it's with truth that sets us free. And it's ultimately about learning to understand absolute true love, our identity, first of all, that He is, it's a person true love, and then we become that love and we're walking it out and behold and become. And that's how we win through true love. Andrew did a great job of touching on the beginning of it. And it says, Adam and Eve were a direct, kind image and likeness of pure love. Andrew said this last week. If you're here, you can go back to last week's. All our messages are online. He did an excellent job of talking about the in-kind image and likeness of pure love. Before Adam and Eve fell, they were in the image of the likeness of pure love. But they didn't have the time to really express it. And so we could really see it. So Jesus had to come back and express it for us. He is the express image of pure love. He was the second Adam, 1 Corinthians 15 says. He was the perfect version of what Adam would have been if he hadn't fallen and Eve hadn't fallen. And so that was before the fall. And, and, and Andrew did another excellent job quoting this verse. 1 John 4, 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who, who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Let me say that again. Whoever does not love does not know God. So the failure to truly love one another is, is again, what do we believe about God? However we love someone is because that's how we're believing God is. If you take to heart what the scriptures say. So it's imperative you need to know the very heart and character. 1 Corinthians 13 of God, the DNA, the character, the personality of God is spelled out in 1 Corinthians 13. 
Everyone who loves God has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. He's a person. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That's philosophy. Learning to live and abide through true love, through an active choice of our free will. Lord, not Father, not my will, but yours. Okay, now, if, 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 that, if Jesus was the first Adam, the first son, and said that to the Father, then who is the second Eve? We are. Now it's, this is where the church has to grow into maturity like Jesus did. Jesus knew the story where it was at, and we know the story. Now we're the, we're the replacement Eve, and we've got to get to the point where we say to Jesus, Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. And then when you, you're going to find that your heart will become alive and passionate when your will becomes His will because His will is about jealous love and He wants to be back with His bride because His will is you. See, it takes a spiritual revelation in your understanding to understand the fullness of God's love for you. And that's why He gave it in the context of marriage, that it's the most intimate form of love there is. See, you can mess with me and that you'll see a one version of Andy. You mess with my wife, you're going to see a whole other version of Andy. And I learned that through marriage. It was caught. I remember our hun, when, we went, when we went to the Packers game, what was that, week one of our marriage? Man, I had this conundrum that happened. We were on a short honeymoon. I'll share a quick story. Hopefully I don't lose it, but I'm trying to make it practical. I got a phone call from a client. He said, hey, I know you're on this small little honeymoon before your big one. I got season, or I got tickets to, and Lambo just got remodeled, to go to, I'll give them to you. You can go sit in the box to go to Lambo. And, but it was with all these, my other clients, these high-end people, blah, blah, blah. We can't go into the whole story. But anyways, I got in this conundrum into being a newly married guy. And uh, where we went and sat in these box seats with everybody. And I mean, it was high end. All, everybody in suit and tie. And Kate and I are these little kids. And we didn't dress up. And, you know, they're eating caviar and all this really nice stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, these are all my clients, business partners, family. I don't know who all these are. Long story short. I felt awkward, and you could go sit outside the box, too, so we did, and I'm like, okay, let's go sit out there, and one of these schmoozers who just didn't know God's love, and I'm not judging, <laughs> but he was tanked, just wasted, and he begins hitting on Kate left and right, and I'm like, oh, Lord, week one, week one, what am I going to do here? <laughs> I mean, this, this jealous, pre-barbaric, prideful Andy, little five foot nothing that... Who are you? You know, back in the day, I lifted weights a little bit more. I was a little bit stronger, but I was still very proud. I'm like, what do I do with this, Lord? I'm still trying to be Christian. I'm like, I'm supposed to be meek and nice, but man, I am infuriated what this guy is doing to my bride right now, and I just want to knock him out. And everything, I mean, I kept looking to Kate, and I'm like, and it's week one, I'm just getting to know her. I'm like, do I need to show her that I'm, I'm not just this little five foot nothing that I can stick up for her? She's safe and secure with me. She's looking at me, kind of giving me the... <laughs> I don't know, because she didn't trust that I could. I don't know. Maybe the truth will come out now. But I'm going through this processing. I'm like, Lord, what do I do with this? I remember praying. I'm like, I know I'm supposed to be Christian, but I just want to level this guy. <laughs> Processing my own heart and soul in the midst of it, needless to say, I didn't do anything about it until, and this is where my face turned red, he wasn't just hitting on her, then he got so loopy that every time she stood and cheered and she sat down, he put his hand underneath her butt when she'd sit. And I, two hands, two hands, I'm just like, oh my gosh, Lord. And I'm like, week one, I'm not even on the honeymoon, we're still supposed to be in this honeymoon stage, you know, the tingles where everything's perfect, right? Anybody that's been married per past two years, doesn't it start out ideal? But then you, there's the natural reality, oh, you're really not that perfect, right? 20 years in, we're learning, we're more opposites, we weren't perfect, it was just the tingles. Anybody, that's what we're going to talk about next week. You married your flesh. It's not one in spirit, one in flesh. You're going to see it in Scripture. That means your baggage and her baggage have come together. Now you've got to work it out and learn how to sacrifice. That's basically next week's message. That's the simple practical. But we have this idealism of perfect love, right? And you think you're marrying into it or you're in this relationship with it, but I'm going to pop that bubble. It doesn't happen in the natural realm. It's only through a spiritual connection. Because if you could get into perfect love with another person, then why would you need Jesus? That's, that's the deception. 
What happened? Yeah, what happened? Oh, oh, Grace didn't even know the full story. <laughs> I was livid. She talked me out of it and like, don't she? She was mature. She she is mature in love. She's like, I'm good. I'm good. Don't worry about it. Partly because she probably knew that if I leveled the guy, I was probably my business partner's partner, and we would have had no business after that. <laughs> I probably would have lost everything with it. But so I didn't do anything about it. But that's an example of us trying to wrestle with our emotions and our what's true, what's right, what's all this, what's going on in here. Reality is I know. Oh yes. <laughs> she just did one of these and he left. <laughs> but we have to wrestle through the, the, the truth of true love and the absolute we all are longing, a deep longing. You will not find anything in the natural realm that's gonna satisfy you your desires of your heart. You can try. That's what temptation is, is whether it's through my job, whether it's through my identity as my profession, whether it's another person, you get a minute of that glory. It's glorious, right? We use this term, like if you sit on a, in Hawaii and like, oh, this is glorious. It's like heaven. But then you get on an airplane and leave and where'd that glory go? See, the glory that the Bible is talking about is when the new heaven, new earth come and paradise is back on earth. And it's eternal. The glory is, you know, like sometimes when your body actually feels good for a moment and you're like, oh, this is glorious. No, the glory is when you get a new body and you live in paradise on the earth for eternity. See, if you don't know the bigger picture, you're constantly going to be chasing like Gomer other things when the fulfillment is in one thing in love, which is Christ. And so this is why how it's made complete. You'll see the absolute in here. It says this is love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us. So you'll never understand perfect love until you understand how much he loved you, not just as a father to a son or a daughter, but the greatest source of that intimacy is, which we're going to, I'm getting long-winded, this week and probably next week we're going to talk about, is that deep, deep intimacy that you have in your heart for a level of intimacy that only comes from marriage, a bride and a bridegroom. And that's where Jesus goes starting in Matthew 20 on. And that's where the book of Revelation is all about. The revealing of him as a bridegroom, king, and judge. Coming back with jealous, ferocious strength and power for his bride. And that's why every one of us, and it's, it's taught in the world, have this fantasy of being swept up by this bride, this, this warrior on a white horse. And that's why every Disney story is that, because that's the deepest longing of our heart. And that's what's going to be fulfilled when Jesus comes on a white horse. Sorry to ruin it for you, husbands and wives. That's not going to be fulfilled through each other. It just isn't. Or else why would you need God? See, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And while his love is made complete, that's an absolute in us. See, now here's the paradox of our faith. This is where you get into sovereign love. And I was just talking to another minister about it, and I talked to Andrew about it. Andrew did a great job. Does God need us? No. Does God need us? Yes. That's a paradox. See, it's learning to have spiritual discernment of what level you're talking about. Does God need us to exist? No. He is, he's created pure and perfect love. It's, it's putting it in this terms when you understand it through a bridal lens. I'm now married to Kate. Do I need her to exist? No. She may pass on, but can I continue to live if I choose to? Yes. But do I need her to consider me? And do I need her to think about me? And do I need her to think about... Um, the vision that God has put on my heart or our heart, and do I need to do the same for her to achieve the greatest desires of our hearts? Yes, you need that. See, that's what Jesus is trying to say is, I need you, bride of Christ. I need you, church, to consider my needs and my desires that I want you, and I can't do that until you let me, until you grow up into maturity and understand how much I love you, or else you're just going to become bitter by me. See, we have to go from being a son of God to a bride of Christ. It's not a, it's not a male-female thing. That's why in the beginning we we're created in one humanity, male and female, one flesh. You'll see the scriptures here. So Andrew did a great job and said, when God is separate from man, his love is not made complete. It's not. God's love is not made complete. Why? Because you complete him. Jerry Maguire, it's not, love is not made complete. Anybody know Jerry? It's Jerry Maguire, right? Love, compl you complete me? 
See, that's, in, that's part of our heart, but only God were made complete in Him. And now that He betrothed Himself to us, He chose you. You need to actually sit down and think about what that means, that God chose you. He legally bound Himself to you, and His eternal destiny is you. The greatest longing on His heart is you. <laughs> that takes a spiritual revelation where you got to say, wow, God, is that true? Like, whoa. And you got to think about a husband and wife. Like, wow, I, it's practical. I remember before I got married to Kate, and going back to my original story, and bringing it somewhat full circle naturally is, so I went on this mission trip, and I said, okay, God, I actually, like it was the week before we connected, said to the Lord, I'm like, okay, Lord, it didn't happen, because school, I actually graduated, but then we had a week before our ceremonies. And I remember getting on my knees saying, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to be single for you if that's what you're asking me to be. But then he opened up my eyes to the purity of that beautiful woman back there and told me this. He said, Andy, you'll never understand full love until you see it through the lens of her purity. And she has taught me more about love than anything. Because I, it's taught and it's caught. Is it easy? Hell no. Do you get the pun? <laughs> it's difficult because it's about self-sacrifice. It's about not self-seeking. It's about laying down my life for one another. And it's a continual process. And, and it's, you, the two become opposite flesh, and so you're generally opposite, so you learn to become an in-between reconciling into one. And that's how you become holy or complete in us. And that's the process that we don't get taught, that I talk about in pre-marriage counseling, that I'll talk more about next week. And that's this verse in Matthew 19. Haven't you read? He replied that at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Not one spirit. You need to understand this. this I had this understanding of this little Christian boy trying to keep my virginity, that when we get married, we're going to become one in spirit. We light this candle. And that's not reality. <laughs> <laughs> you become one flesh. Your baggage and her baggage become one, and you got to learn to work it out in love. And it goes on in Genesis, taking it back to the garden, because it's about the fall and redeeming the fall and true love and self-sacrifice. He said, Then man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. See, when I th thought about marriage, I could have stayed single, but when the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Andy, no, I want you to be married, because he knew my heart better than I knew myself. And staying single, I want to understand the fullness of his life and I needed her to help me. And so I abided in that and I began to see what he saw, the purity in her heart. But I had to have this moment like you all did is this, is if I choose marriage, I'm choosing a whole different life and destiny. Because if I live by myself, I can do whatever I want. But if I live with this person, now I'm letting go of that control and I'm now choosing to do what that person wants as well. So my question is this, do you want to be married to God? Do you want to be married to Jesus as your bridegroom? Because what you're saying is this, is if I say yes to Jesus, the Spirit and the bride says, come, now it's not just about what He's going to do for me. It's no self-reciprocating. Am I going to do what He wants? See, that's where it goes in the end of Matthew, is what does God really want? What is the greatest desires of His heart? And that's where you go on to maturity. But I can promise you this, is when your heart becomes His heart, it becomes the fullness of everything you've desired. Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in His image. In the image of God, He created them male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now it's about ruling. It's about subduing. But it's also about submitting. See, these things is we got to learn is how did Jesus philosophically say to do this thing? So we are supposed to rule and subdue the earth through love, the lens and the force of love. And so my heart for my life, where I'm going, and I hope you'll continue to go with me, because I've committed in my heart this. I know we're in birth pains, and I'm going to rule over this thing. 
I want to be a victor, not a victim. See, the world is teaching this victim mentality, and the way I'm going to be a victor is in Christ. I can do all things. He that is in me is greater than that's in the world. And we need to grow up into our identity in this bridal position that I'm so deeply, intimately in love by God, and I understand the bigger picture so that any time tribulation comes, this is not my destiny. My destiny is what's coming. And this great, deep intimacy that I haven't even fully experienced yet until Christ comes is going to so deeply touch my heart in ways that I've never experienced. That's how I get through this pregnancy. See, I learned that through my wife as well when I watched her make an active choice in pregnancy to say, hey, it's going to be painful, but the goal of grace and the goal of Elise and this unknown, but I know it's going to be good, that gave her the motivation to get through the pain. And that's where we need to go into maturity for the next birth pain that comes is, hey, this is nothing because this is temporal and what eternally is coming is far greater than what we're seeing with our eyes and experiencing in our flesh. And so and that's what Jesus is trying to get us to is, and I want to give you this picture and I want to pause and I want you to begin to meditate a little bit on what I thought or what I spoke on is this. And here's the image. You need to begin to see the fullness of the identity of God to be victory in any aspect of your life. When you see Him of the Lamb of God is when you're struggling with shame, guilt, and condemnation. You need to see Him as this one who's this shepherd that's willing to leave the 99 and go after you because you're under shame, guilt, and condemnation. And He loves you so deeply because you're His bride and His child. And no matter what happens, He just wants to get you and clean you up and bring you back into safety and security of His heart. But you also need to see Him. When you're feeling like a victim, when you're feeling sick, when you're feeling weak and you don't feel strength, you need to begin to see Him as a lion of the tribe of Judah. Is God a big God that can devour any of your problems, or is He still just the little lamb of God? See, we need to grow into this maturity. The bigger that God is, the smaller my problem is. And if I, have I overcome this? No. Do I still stumble at times? Yes. But that's where we need to be humble enough at times, even myself as a pastor, is if I get under something, my hope is you as brothers and sisters in Christ will come gently get me, and I need to humble myself. There's time. Do I believe in absolute healing through the power of the Holy Ghost? Absolutely, because Jesus... Jesus did it, and now the power of Christ is in me. Have I seen people healed? Yes. Have I seen myself healed? Yes. Do I still get sick at times? Yes. Can I get under something, the weather? Yes, because there's a humanity side. But we need to even get to the point of humility and love that if I'm not, if I'm in a place of unbelief, church, let's come together too and let's pray for one another and remind each other the bigger picture. Remind, hey, your hope is in what? Hey, your strength is in what? Who are you? What's your identity? Rise up, brother and sister, and if you're in unbelief, let my faith help you. Do you see yourself as this intimate bride? I know this is a stretch for guys, just like being a son of God is a stretch for female, but you've got to stretch yourself. Do I see myself where I can submit to somebody I trust? Absolutely. I will submit to somebody that I know is absolutely good. I have no problem submitting to Jesus Christ. He's a perfect leader, a perfect father, and a perfect dad. But the word submission in the world is like a four-letter word, right? We don't submit to anybody because pride doesn't submit. Pride is all rooted in fear and pride, and, and I don't submit to anything because that's what strength is, right? It's male and female. The word submission in our culture is... That is, there is an attack on that. But there is something very powerful when you submit yourself to the Lord. Because what you do is you put yourself in a position of humility. And that's what Paul said. He said, hey, when I am weak, you are strong. When I submit to you the power of your Holy Spirit, and now you can work through me, that when I go to pray for somebody, it's not Andy going to pray, but it's just I'm a vessel and a beacon that the power of love is going to come and operate in and through me, spirit, soul, body, unto that person. And it had nothing to do about me. It's just the Word of God being active as a participant. And he that's in me is greater than he's in the world. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I declare perfect health. And I just believe that because I've been taught that. Because I believe absolute truth is Christ.
But do you see yourself as his bride? And if you're trying to find that intimacy from anything else or anybody else, you're going to continually be disappointed. You'll get a glimpse of it. Do I see Kate as a perfect bride sometimes? Yeah. I love you, Kate, but are you perfect? Now, she's way more perfect than I am. I will happily say that. She is. She is, inspires me. I'm the one, usually most of the problem in our marriage is me. Because I was a very prideful guy coming into this thing. I'm, I have no problem saying that. I'm trying to eradicate, eradicate pride in my life. In fact, God has taken me back on this journey. 15 years ago was where I was at the peak of my pride, and I got humiliated, and I don't want to go back and recycle it because see, pride is painful. If you don't have pride, can you ever get hurt? You can't, because your, your focus isn't on yourself. If you have absolutely no pride and you're 100% humility, that means you're thinking of something else or someone else. But if there's no pride there, you can kick that, you can hit that. They're not thinking of themselves, and so it's not going to be hurt. See, that's the elementary principle in Hebrews he's trying to teach, about, teach us about, is that pride is the greatest deception there is. It's a counterpoint to glory. Glory is about His works. Pride is about our works. Glory is the manifestation of absolute truth. So do you see yourself as His bride, that I'm no longer this dirty, rotten sinner? Because if you believe that, your behavior is going to manifest that. But now God has redeemed me from that place. I am this son of God that, yes, I screwed up as a kid. I was self-seeking and proud. But by your grace and your mercy, you saved me spiritually. But now inside my spirit, I am made whole and new like you. And now in my spirit, you see me perfect and pure and blameless and holy and righteous. And it's the righteousness of Christ that you see me now as his bride. You don't see me flesh to flesh. You see me as spirit to spirit and I'm this bride of Christ. And so when I stumble, I just turn back and say, hey, wow, you died on the cross. You became sin so that I could become righteousness. And now, even though we stumble, we do not fall because we pick ourselves back up because now in God's eyes, I'm beautiful and righteous. And the scriptures will testify to that coming up. If I don't get to it in time, it will. Now I'd like to look at Proverbs 18.22. And it says this, He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. So you see all throughout scriptures that from the very beginning, as Andrew pointed out last week, to now as I'm talking about this week, so from the very beginning, uh, marriage was in there from the very beginning with Adam and Eve as perfect and pure love. Here in the middle in the Proverbs, the wisdom chapter, uh, book of the Bible, and in the chapters it says, finding a wife is a good thing, and we receive favor from the Lord in it. And it's when we learn to just see marriage as a beautiful thing about finding favor with one another, helping one another, encouraging one another in Christ and becoming like that perfect love together is what's really good. It's the grace within the context of the relationship all throughout. But there is this place that we need to grow in our relationship in understanding to God as a child of God and then moving beyond that and into this marriage relationship that Christ calls us to. And we see that in the scriptures, even under the Old Testament in Hosea. It, Hosea is paralleled with where we're going in Matthew and we'll be going into in the next couple weeks. Hosea 2.16, 19-20 says this, In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. Husband, you will no longer call me my master. And so we see this growth process of going from being this child and understanding the, the Abba Daddy love, the grace of God, and we need to grow into it of getting out of legalism that He's just this master that's trying to control us, but that He truly is a loving God who's Abba Daddy, but we can't stop there. It's God's very heart as the bridegroom, as Jesus, longing for His bride that He, he doesn't want want us to see him as just a master. He wants to see him as a husband. And it's that relationship that is so powerful to the human heart. It's the most intimate relationship there is, which is in marriage, because it takes so much self-sacrifice. And that's what Jesus did for us. He chose us. He chose you. He chose me. It says in 19, I will betroth you to me forever. So Jesus chose, legally bound himself to you and me because he loves us so much. 
It goes on to say, I'll betroth you in righteousness, in justice, in love, in compassion. I'll betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. Notice how it says you will acknowledge the Lord. Because later on, Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. So step one, we need to acknowledge the Lord as more than just our master, but become this deep, intimate relationship of growth as like a, as like a husband and a wife and self-sacrificing to one another. But here Hosea goes on to reveal that we're destroyed when we lack that spiritual understanding and knowledge of what true love is, that it's self-sacrifice. And if we take this farther, and this is why I'm so passionate about it, is for every one of us, when we lose that big picture that it's about a deep, intimate love relationship, on some level we begin to destroy ourselves and or somebody else. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, that spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding, that it's all about love. And true love, true mature love, is about sacrifice. So we grow from being this child that's mostly self-seeking to becoming more like a husband and a wife who should grow and mature into this place of self-sacrifice, helping one another along the way. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 18 says, But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains. Notice that language, same veil, remains. It's the picture of a bridal veil. When the Old Covenant is read, why in the Old Covenant? Because under the Old Covenant, they saw God mostly as this master and not so much as a husband. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil, hear this, a veil covers their heart. So do you see how the mind can be made dull and the heart is ignorant? Under this old covenant thinking of that God is just my master versus he's my friend and ultimately he's the fulfillment of the most intimate love expression there is to our heart. But it does say in 16, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So that veil is taken away. We can begin to see clearly what mature love looks like and we can behold that. That's how much God loves me. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God loves us and our heart becomes strengthened so that we can truly begin to love one another more like he first loved us. In 17 it says now the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is a spirit. What that's saying is this, is as we pull back the veil, meaning we get the light and the understanding that God's heart and God's desire, Jesus' heart as a husband is to be together with you and me, to be together with us in a deep relationship and intimacy and authenticity. That ever increasing glory, meaning the understanding that he wants to come back and that zeal for his heart to want to come back begins to pull back the veil, the deception of what our heart truly longs for as we talked about in 1 John 4 how his love and our love are only made complete when we are together one in heart and one will one mind so in closing the final chapter I want to talk about is Ephesians 5 which shows us the parallels of this so Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 reads it this way, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to yourselves and to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy and cleansing her by the washing of water through the word, and to present her, and hear this clearly verse 27, it says, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. 
This is a profound mystery, it says. But notice what it says in the red. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So we now know that this bridal paradigm, this metaphor, is about us, the church, the replacement Eve, as the going back to the garden and redeeming Eve, and about Christ as our bridegroom. And the question is, just as, or just like a woman chooses to submit in the natural to her husband, are we willing to submit to Jesus, our husband, and his will in that? Do we truly believe He is good? Do we truly believe He's loving and kind? And our life or my life is better with Him than without Him. Am I willing to say yes to His very heart and His very desires for me in this relationship and then where He wants to go into the future? And Andrew last week just talked about how for him, and I close with this last thought for you to ponder, as he said, when he was in the military, um, he'd be graded, if you want to call it that, or reviewed. And in his review, they'd either review him through his potential or through his performance. So it was based on either his potential or his performance. And he said he really enjoyed it when he was reviewed based on his potential. And that's how God sees you and I. If you go back to verse 27, it says, Present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blameless, any blemish, but holy and blameless. So that's how he sees us as a potential of how we will be, not how we are right now. Yes, we are holy and blameless and righteous in our spirit nature because of what he did for us. But as we're growing in our soul realm or in the physical realm, we're not always perfect, but there's grace for that. And so he begins begins to see us based on the performance of what will be, not what is. And when he comes back and how he renews a new heaven and a new earth and we get a new life and a new creation and he knows once he removes the evil out of this world what the fullness we will be is. And so he sees life through a lens of potential of what the world will look like when, after he comes back and what his bride will look like after he's destroyed evil. But my question for you to, to you today, for you here today and those watching online is, do you see yourself that way as the beloved son of God, but as a beloved bride of Christ? In his eyes, he sees you as pure and holy and blameless because he sees you spirit to spirit. And in that, in that place, are you ready to grow up and mature into self-sacrifice and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Do you trust that he really is good and he has a plan for your life and my life, an eternal plan that's better with him than without him? And in that, will your heart burn and desire to want to be together with him so much that you say, Lord, come. For next week, we're going to talk more about the bridal paradigm and then the natural realities of life, the challenges we face right now. But um, we're going to close with a video a song. And for those online, I'll add that as a link. Um, it's a great song that I just encourage you to listen to and think of the words and then think about what I've spoken prior to this. And just pray about it and talk to the Lord about it. My prayer is that you're blessed through the song and through this message and you begin to see yourself as Christ sees you.